Buonasera a tutti, uh, welcome everybody at the Italian Cultural Institute. This is the second event of uh, reshaping the past and is dedicated to memory monuments and community. Uh, tonight we will have a panel of, on the animated discussion that in recent time has taken place about the presence of monuments to represent a controversial heritage from the past, like the ones dedicated to Cristoforo Colombo or those dedicated to the representatives of confederates in the south of the United States. And also about what monuments and memorials mean for a community. Uh, the speaker of tonight will be uh, Harriet Seni, professor of uh, art history and director of the MA program in art history at Art Museum Studies uh, at City College of New York. In 2008, with Professor uh, Kraus Knight, she co-founded Public Art Dialogue, an international organization that is also uh, a college art association affiliate. Um, and the journal Public Art um, Dialogue that she uh, co-edits with uh, Professor, uh, Professor Knight has appeared uh, twice annually since 2011 and is the only peer review public publication devoted to public art. On September 8, 2017, Professor Seni joined the Major Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art, Monuments and Markers a group that advises Mayor de Blasio on issues relating uh, to public art and historic monuments and markers. Uh, Fraser Rottanelli is professor of history at University of Southern uh, Florida. Um, his areas of speciali specialization are ethnic and labor history, comparative migration, and U.S. history in a global age. On these topics, he has written two books and numerous articles and essays. He is currently completing a book uh, manuscript on migration and the shaping of ethnic identity. Uh, it also serves as part of the research team of the Azaba Memorial Project, an effort to document and memorialize a mass killing of civilians that took place in 1967 during the Nigerian Civil War. The moderator, moderator but not only moderator of Tonight will be Nadia Urbinati, uh, Kyriakos Sakopoulos Professor of, on Political Theory and Hellenic Studies at Columbia University. So please enjoy. So thank you, everybody. And I thought since we have more time, because uh, we have uh, um, one guest uh, that didn't make it. So I thought of introducing this panel with um, reference to an, an Italian case, uh, just um, very recent, uh, which is an interesting example of how it's possible to come uh, to terms with the national history we don't like, and, uh, and how can we make sense of that history, because it's part of the history of our country, after all. Uh, and this is the case uh, of an older Italian city called Bolzano, Bolzan, for those who are um, South Euroan people, um, who uh, had to, to come to terms with the monuments. Uh, um, according to the Italian government in 2011, they had to solve the problem of a monument that they had, meaning the monument is a, a, um, a monument uh, representing Mussolini on a horse and with the um, written uh, um, line from uh, fascism, as we know very well, um, credere, obedire, combattere. Mm -hmm. Believe, obey, and combat. So uh, the city of Bolton decided to, um, to have a kind of uh, a public uh, 
com competition on what to do with these monuments. And um, the competition was uh, so successful that 500 proposals arrived to the municipal town and they had uh, a committee uh, composed of uh, art historians, journalists, uh, ordinary citizens, um, representative of their own associations. Uh, and they came with the final um, uh, short list of five. And then uh, the municipal town, the municipal council voted uh, the, uh, the, the, the winner. And the winner is an interesting one. I, I, I Unfortunately, I don't have this apparatus, but I, I wish I, um, I, uh, I had with me. It's uh, in this, the same monument is there, but with the lead um, uh, light uh, written in three languages, Italian, German, and Ladino, uh, with a um, citation from Anne Arendt. Anne Arendt is a German Jewish historian escaped from uh, this, uh, Germany and here in New York, a very important figure in uh, New York academic life and intellectual life. And the, um, the uh, s famous quotation from Anna Arendt reads, nobody has the right to obey. So obey, combat, but not, nobody has the right to obey. This is an interesting case of how to have a contextualized monument uh, in the past and in the present. And how a monument is a sign of uh, a contested history, but also um, a history that has an history, so-called. So the monument has an history, and uh, uh, in the present time gives and participates in making the history of the monument. So it's an interesting case of how to deal with uh, uh, monuments, uh, or one monument, in a, um, in a um, time of contesting uh, meanings concerning past and monuments. So with this, uh, small history about uh, our country. I would like to uh, let the floor to you um, and you can uh, introduce and then uh, uh, 15 minutes you say and then uh, the second speaker then we can have a debate or a question. It's going to be more like 20 minutes so <laughs> hang in there. <laughs> Well, you said we had a little extra time. Um, so uh, my remarks tonight are intended to make us think about the memorials we think we know or at least recognize and hopefully think again. So let's start with something that everybody knows, a very familiar image, the Lincoln Memorial dating from 1919 to 21, obviously on the National Mall in DC. The architect was Henry Bacon. Both the memorial and the NAACP originated in impulses to honor Lincoln on the 100th anniversary of his birth, so February 12th, 1909. <coughs> Two years later, Congress creates a commission to memorialize Lincoln, chaired by President Taft. It was built to commemorate Lincoln as the man who saved the Union. So the exterior, the columns, and the festoons embody the state's so just for a little bit of historical context, only one month earlier, just one month earlier, Georgia became the last southern state to enact black disenfranchisement rules. So the architect, Daniel Chester French. The inscription over Lincoln says, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever for whom he saved the Union, being the operable words here. It says nothing about slavery. That would have been really inflammatory at this point in history. And it raises one issue that's always important, which is to think about what a memorial leaves out. Sometimes that's as important as what it leaves in. Um, at the time that it was dedicated, there was a colored seating area in the back. The black press denounced biased speeches and segregated seating as a mockery of Lincoln's ideals. Certainly that was the case. The mainstream press ignored the problem. Um, interestingly, the meaning of the memorial, or the emphasis, I should say, of the memorial was transfer, transformed over time through use. 
So in 1939, Marian Anderson does a concert there on Easter Sunday. In 1963, there's the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, Martin Luther King's famous speech. And of course, in 2009, Obama's inaugural celebration. So the Anderson concert, that's what starts the shift in meaning. Howard University was looking for a larger off-campus site because the DAR had barred Anderson from their tax-exempt Constitution Hall. That was something that prompted Eleanor Roosevelt to resign. Um, Anderson began her concert by singing America. Scripts for the radio commentators all referred to the structure as the memorial to the great emancipator. So the meaning was starting to shift already. This at a time when the Capitol was still segregated and Anderson had to sleep in a private house. She couldn't get a hotel room. Um, but what this concert did was it established a ritual of protest. So after this, mass railing, rallies rather than pickets, performing patriotic and spiritual music, choosing a religious format, inviting prominent platform guests, self-policing of crowds so that an orderly image was projected. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, alluding to Lincoln in publicity and oratory and using this memorial as a site of choice, not default. I think this is the image you were looking at before. Um, when you all came in. Um, this is the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Lincoln Memorial was the chosen site from the beginning. Martin Luther P King begins his speech with a direct reference to Lincoln. He says, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And of course, in 2009, Obama's inaugural celebration changed the focus of this memorial, I think, forever. Of course, there's no such thing as forever when we speak about memorials, as we now know, but hope springs. Um, so these events demonstrate how a memorial is used over time and how that use can change its perceived meaning. But what if memorials are not used in some way? Do we remember the things they commemorate? So, how many of you recognize this? Oh, great. Two out of a room. That's more than I've heard before. Um, do you know where it is? Great. And so you know what it represents. So this is for most of you in the room who don't know. And I didn't know until a short time ago. This is the Slocum Memorial Fountain by Bruno Lewis Sim, dedicated in 1906 in Tompkins Square Park. Slocum was a triple-decker wooden ship that had been built in 1891. It was named after General Henry Warner Slocum, who was a Civil War general who had also represented the city of Brooklyn in Congress for three terms. Um, it was a steamer, one of nearly a dozen excursion boats that traveled around New York waterways. Typically, it was used by working class people to escape the city for a few hours. So June 15, 1904, it catches fire in the East River, kills almost 1,300 passengers and 35 crew members. It's the city's deadliest disaster before September 11th. And it remains, as far as I know, the worst inland waters peacetime tragedy in our history. Devastated in a replaceable part of the Lower East Side, known as Little Germany. Um, and because it occurred on a weekday, the majority of the German immigrants um, and German people, people of German descent, were women and children, right? The men were at work. This had huge international resonance, not just in this country and in other media besides newspapers. It was a major reference in James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, it takes place entirely, the book takes place entirely on June 16, 1904. In one scene, a character who has read the morning paper muses about the previous day's catastrophe. Terrible affair, that General Slocum explosion. Terrible, terrible. A thousand casualties. Actually, there were more, right? 
and heart-rending scenes, men trampling down women and children, most brutal thing. The composer Charles Ide wrote an orchestral piece about it, and as far as I know, this is probably one of the few classical works ever devoted to a single brief historic event. Never finished the musical arrangement, was completed eventually in 1970, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm using these two examples to show how significant an event this was and how it had permeated culture as well as national and international news. And yet, only two people in this room had ever heard of it. Okay, so if we don't use a monument, and it's not a really impressive monument, but it's in the area to which it belongs, um, it disappears from memory. If we started using it again, that could change. Um, perhaps a comparable tragedy is the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire that took place on March 25th in 1911, just off Washington Square. It killed far fewer people, 145, I believe. W certainly one of the deadliest disasters in the United States industrial history. Uh, these deaths, so everybody's heard of that, am I right? Okay, so, so think about how come, because we don't have a memorial yet, but we will soon. Um, these deaths were largely preventable. The victims died because of neglected safety features, the sprinklers, et cetera, the locked doors, um, led to legislation pertaining to workers' conditions and, and had an effect. So we're only now getting a memorial. Um, it's still in the building stage. This is the design uh, by Richard June Yu and Erie Wegman. It will feature steel panels intended to engage passers-by both up close and from afar. The panels will curve around both sides of the building. The names of the victims cut into an upper panel will be reflected on the lower one. And it's a little hard to see from these images how effective it will be, but, but these are the latest public documents. So both these events raise issues about memorials to victims that is as opposed to heroes. That's an issue that comes up with one sculpture that's the subject of a current controversy, the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial. So are we there? Yes. Um, this controversy, I'm sure you've all heard about this, right? It's impossible not to, no? Oh, great. I didn't get to tell you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay, so this controversy centered on the depiction of the perceived victims flanking Theodore Roosevelt. They have been in some news reports, um, refer the, the African figure, it's actually an African figure, has been referred to as an American slave. This is not the case. So although I passed this memorial many times, many times, I'd never really looked at it closely. So what I'm going to do next is share some of the preliminary research that I did because there's um, a lot of controversy around this. Uh, the research was based on preliminary archival work, some other research, conversations that I had with curators of American sculpture. So I'm going to give you a, a fair amount of detail here, or at least the amount I have at this point, because I'd like to expand the information that I believe has not been much in the press if at all. So I would like to know, with my remarks in the next few minutes, how much afterwards, how much of this information is new to you? Okay, so if you could just bear with me and be thinking about that. Um, I'd also like to emphasize how much more there is to know and how complex memorial issues can be. So, for starters, the statue of Theodore Roosevelt, which is the focus of the controversy, is part of a larger memorial complex dedicated to Roosevelt. It includes not only the facade of the museum, it's the Museum of Natural History, right? Everybody can cite that, good. Um, and its sculpture, but also the surrounding wall, the inscriptions, the reliefs, as well as murals and more inside the building. And an interesting fact that I learned recently it was intended to lead to an underground tunnel, also lined with murals, that was intended to link the Museum of Natural History to the Natural 
to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Wouldn't that have been cool? I don't know if that they'll ever do it, but I like to think so. Um, okay, we have the artist's interpretation of what he intended the statue to mean, and there'll be, I'll say more about the artist shortly. Um, artist said in 1940, when the work was dedicated, Theodore Roosevelt, in this equestrian monument, rides forth with his always dynamic personality. The two figures at his sides are guides, symbolizing the continents of Africa and America, and if you choose, may stand for Roosevelt's friendliness to all races. Symbolize, these are allegories. Um, the commission, in 1920, New York State Legislature created a commission to find proposals that, quote, for all time stand as a visible recognition of the services of one who had been the most active in the welfare and development of New York and the United States, end quote. The legislature wanted to emphasize three key factors. Roosevelt as naturalist and citizen, well he's in front of the Museum of Natural History, right, that makes sense. The memorial as essentially an educational institution and an overall lofty standard of idealism through harmonious lines inspired by the golden age of architecture. John Russell Pope was selected as the architect and he chose the sculpture. So just a few key dates. In 1929, United States obtained access, New York State rather, obtained access to land facing Central Park West. This is really important that New York State owned that land because at this point there does not seem to be archival information that indicates the city owns it. If in fact the state owns it, we may have a Cuomo de Blasio issue and we know <laughs> how contentious those are. Another one. Uh, yet another one, exactly. We don't know, I don't know this, that's the information I have to date based on the archives that are available in Parks Department on whose property or who's in general in charge of, of this. Um, in 36, the indoor portions of the monument were dedicated and in 1940, the statue was added. So there are many elements of the commission. There are figures on top of the columns that represent Daniel Boone, John Adams Audubon, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark. All of these are prominent naturalists and explorers. The same artists did them all. The inscription on top of the columns of the trees read truth, knowledge, vision. The dedication over the central portion of the parapet reads, the State of New York Memorial to Theodore Roosevelt, a great leader of the youth of America in energy and fortitude, in faith of our fathers, in defense of the rights of people, in the love and conservation of nature, and of the best in life and in man. There are animals carved behind these figures on the parapet. I'm not sure you can see them from these images, but um, the animals behind the Native American are, are animals that are found in North America. The animals behind the African are animals that are found in Africa. So there's no way this could be an American figure. The inscription on the terrace of the parapet identifies Roosevelt as ranchman, scholar, explorer, scientist, conservationist, naturalist, statesman, author, historian, humanitarian, soldier, and patriot. A lot, a lot of um, words. Does anybody know the sculptor's name? And I didn't when I started the research. It's there now. Has anybody heard of him before? And that's another interesting thing about how certain people who may be very well known in their lifetime can disappear from history. Okay, a little bit about his history. He was a really, really important sculptor um, during this period. His, his family had moved to South Dakota when he was a, a young man, um, and he had a very personal relationship with Native Americans. Um, he, he has written in a letter towards the end of his life explaining this, uh, where he says, I played with Indian children and liked their games very much. Often hunters wintering with Indians stopped to visit my grandfather on their way south, and in that way I heard many stories of Indians. On one occasion, a fine, fuzzy, bearded old hunter remarked with much bitterness, the Indians will all be driven into the Pacific Ocean. That thought so impressed me that I couldn't forget it, and in fact, it created a picture in my mind which eventually became the end of the trail, which is his most famous work. Um, he was a very well-trained artist. 
He was immersed in the contemporary art issues of his time. In 1893, he visited the World's Columbian Exposition many times. A couple of years later, he studies in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And there, St. Gaudens takes him on as an assistant and later brings him to New York. So that in the years from 1898 to 1902, Fraser makes major contributions to several St. Gordon statues, and he's the principal assistant on General Sherman. That's now opposite um, the plaza. So he was pretty important. Um, he, in 1906, he gets the commission to sculpt the portrait of Theodore Roosevelt for the Senate. St. Gordon's at that point was too ill, and so he recommended Fraser. In 1923, he does the Alexander Hamilton, the United States Treasury Building. He also did busts for our New York City Hall of Fame, which happily have not yet been removed. Um, Patrick Henry, Ulysses Grant, and St. Gaudens. I think those are safe. Um, do you remember the Buffalo Nickel? He designed that. Um, it was called the ultimate homage to our native or Indian prairie tradition um, and was considered a very important work. In the early 20s, he becomes a member of the National Council of Fine Arts, 25 to 27. He's the president of the National Sculpture Society. Uh, in 27, he's also elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And so during this period between the world wars, he was the Washington's most prolific sculptor. So when we start to think about these things also as works of art, which memorials hopefully are, we want to keep in mind how important he was. Um, so the Native American sculpture uh, figure here that you see, his concept dates from the late 20s to the early 30s. He's wearing a war bonnet that's commonly associated with Great Plains tribe. It's been described as displaying stoic dignity and nobility and suggesting a seasoned warrior or leader who's familiar with weapons of war. Do you see that they're carrying rifles? I only saw that for the first time a couple of weeks ago. They're in between the figures and the equestrian monument. Okay. Um, the African figure has scarification on his temples. They frame each eye, and that's considered a sign of status. It's been suggested that he may have been a warrior or maybe the son of a chief who might somewhere, sometime, look after the welfare of his people. So what I want to emphasize with all that is that the flanking figures are allegorical. They represent America and Africa, as the sculptor said. One carries a rifle, the Native Americans is pointed down, the Africans is pointed up. A curator of American sculpture suggested to me that this might indicate the end of the American continent as a site of exploration, as opposed to the opportunities that were considered to be opening up in Africa. Also, at this point in time, it's extremely unusual, if not a first, to portray a black figure anywhere carrying a gun, especially considering given the racial climate in this country. In any event, can we agree that these allegorical figures do not look abject? Okay. Um, so also conceptually as guides, which is what they were intended to be, they're of necessity beneath the, sub, the main subject of the statue, which is Theodore Roosevelt. If you think of General Sherman and the figure of victory, she's also on the ground. Of course, she's easier to see as an allegory because she has wings, right? I often wonder what would happen if these guys had wings, but that would not be appropriate. Um, there seems to be today a significant problem in understanding allegory. Sometimes I think it's a little bit like the problem that some people have in understanding abstraction. That is, it's hard to get past a literal reading and into an art historical context. So the big protest, and why I've gone on about this at some length, the big protest against this memorial is that Roosevelt was an imperialist. You may have heard of some of the local movements decolonized this place. Uh, so to counteract that a little bit, or maybe to complicate that narrative, I want to bring out the fact that Roosevelt was also known for non-racist actions. He was the first president to entertain an African-American, Booker T. Washington, in the White House. And when he was vice president, his first act was to appoint an African-American 
as executive messenger against protests. He also protested publicly crimes against blacks in East St. Louis in 1917, and these were praised in the press. He saved and protected Native American rooms by classifying them as national monuments. This was in the Antiquities Act of 1906. Unquestionably, he was a product of his time. But it remains to, to be seen how can we understand him in the multifaceted complexity of that time and of ours. Um, also, a hunter and a conservationist, let's not forget He's responsible for the National Reclamation Act of 1902, which was dedicated to large-scale irrigation projects in the West. He set aside almost 200 million acres of national forests, reserves, and wildlife refuge, almost five times as much as the land of all his predecessors combined. He's also the first president to win a Nobel Peace Prize for his negotiations to end the Russo-Japanese War. Okay, so. But the imperialist aspect remains a problem. Then there's also a problem with the policies of the museum, which was incorporated in 68, 1908, Henry Fairfield Osborne becomes the director. He believed in eugenics. Um, the second international conference in eugenics was held at the Museum of Natural History. Eugenics is part of a progressive, uh, uh, was part of the progressive movement and again, just by way of context, Margaret Mead, also celebrated in the museum, right? And Margaret Sanger, without whom many women in professional life might still be in the kitchen, also believed in eugenics. However, given the contemporary presentist lens, many see this only as a monument to colonialism and oppression. So the big drive to have this removed, and that's where the controversy is, is that interpretation. And uh, what I would like to suggest is without this kind of fuller picture, which if nothing else complicates things, and I really began to feel um, that many people are taking a kind of Rorschach approach to memorials and other public art. You know, there was this kind of commentary, some of you may have read in the paper, um, a small boy asks his dad, how come the white man's on the horse and the other figures are on the ground? And this, you know, suggests superiority, subjugation, but it's something that also needs to be seen in a historical context. Okay, so what do we do with problematic memorials? This is a strategy that's similar, I think, to the ones that we just heard about in Bolsano, um, this is Christoph Wodisko's public projection at the Bunker Hill Monument from 1998. Um, this ran for three nights. Bunker Hill Monument, right, that's familiar. Um, this features interviews with mothers from Charleston, that's where the Bunker Hill Monument is, speaking of personal experiences, mostly about their murdered children. Charleston was known to have a really high murder rate and the residents were afraid to go to the police. So what does this do? In a way, it regenders the monument, right? It, it at least uses it to mark private fam family pain as expressed by women as opposed to more masculine wartime uh, sacrifice that Bunker Hill was about. Or a little closer to home, um, this is his projection on Abraham Lincoln from 2012 in Union Square. Um, the sculpture of Lincoln, which is behind this figure, um, was done by Henry Kirk Graham. That's the artist who also did the George Washington Monument in, in the front of Union Square. This is in the north of Union Square, if you need to place it. Um, his Lincoln dates from 1870. This was originally sponsored by the Union League Club. Uh, Union Square, as you probably know, has significance as a site of protest for social justice. Okay, so what are we looking at here? The artist spoke with dozens of American war vets and family members. He focused on the traumatic consequences of war, the difficulty of returning to civilian life, their sense of experience of loss and guilt. Then he edits the interviews down and projects them on the statue, which then appears to speak. It's very spooky. Did anybody happen to see it? No, I probably wasn't publicized enough. There are many other possible strategies um, 
and that would be a good subject for us to talk about. I'd like to close with a couple of remarks that are based on the work that I did on the tilted art controversy. I don't know how many of you remember that, yes? Yay. Um, so this was about Richard Serra's sculpture, which was located at Federal Plaza from 1981 to 1989 in Lower Manhattan. I have to say, one of the last times I taught this in a course at the Graduate Center, one student piped up and said I was three when this happened, and so I'm happy that some of you remember it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, some of my takeaways from that are Tilted Arc is more famous in its absence than it ever was in its presence. I open my book on the controversy with a quote by Toni Morrison. Spectacle is the best means by which an official story is formed and a superior mechanism for guaranteeing its longevity. Certainly that applies to the current controversies. And it does raise a real issue because in our responses today and even in terms of the memorial uh, commission having been formed, we are acting reactively and controversies are always political. And so there's a sense that we may be driven by factors that are not always apparent. Um, the controversy also raised a very important caveat which was perhaps best expressed by this quote by Gara LaMarche, who was the executive director of the Fund for Free Expression uh, for the Human Rights Watch. If we look into the mirror one morning and see a censor staring back, there's a good chance one will soon be knocking at the door. And finally, let's consider the issue of censorship. If public art is a form of speech, then removing or altering it permanently is a form of censorship but also so is the omission or erasure of certain segments of the population who have not been recognized in our public spaces. So where does that leave us? Thank you. Get out of my PowerPoint. I will actually get to this image. Oh, right, right, the microphones. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Is this is this microphone on? Yeah, yeah is it working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I were actually to give a talk, a uh, title to this talk, I would probably call it uh, A Tale of Three Monuments, Monuments to Engage With, Monuments to Remove, and Monuments that Need to Be Built. Um, As, as, as you've mentioned, the, uh, the renewed national discussion over the fate of monuments and memorials that honor Confederate leaders uh, and slaveholders has led to a dialogue on other historical figures prominently displayed in public spaces across the country. Theodore Roosevelt, Dr. James Marion Sims, uh, St. Junipero Serra out on the coast. Following the tragic events in Charlottesville, Virginia, among all the monuments discussed, none have produced as much opposition within the Italian American community as much as the proposals to remove statues honoring Christopher Columbus, statues scattered across the country, and the fascist monument to Italo Balbo and the nearby Balbo Drive in Chicago. Uh, when I started thinking about this, this talk, I guess my, the first question that came to mind was why are these two figures, why have these two yes, monuments and, and sorts of monuments. Why have they generated so much support within the ethnic community, within the Italian American ethnic community in this, in this country? As we address this question, there are a number of issues to keep in mind. The first, of course, as a native Italian, is that Columbus, while certainly a recognized fi uh, figure of the early modern period, is not a widely recognized national symbol in Italy. For instance, when Italian authorities had to choose a name for the Rome airport of Fiumicino, 
Italy's main point of international entry, they chose Leonardo da Vinci. Columbus is seen as a reg regional figure, a Genoese at the service of Spain. Appropriately then, the Genova airport carries his name. Also, in the uh, toponymy of Italian cities, central streets and squares are not named after him, nor are statues of him prominent. They exist, but they're not central. In Italy, the issue concerning the memorialization of fascist leaders like Balbo is more complicated. And I'm really glad you raised the issue of Bolzano, because what they did was absolutely fabulous, what they were able to do. Some monuments and inscriptions dating back to the regime, dating back to the Ventennio, survived the war. Yet current campaigns to find ways to honor quote unquote intellectuals like Giovanni Gentile and Alessandro Pavolini, as well as others known for their quote unquote again non-political accomplishments like Rodolfo Graziani, or in our case Italo Balbo, are ideologically charged and put forth by right-wing and pro-fascist groups and personalities. So here you have Col Colombo who really doesn't really make it in Italy as a, as a national figure, and, and this political association with these other characters uh, that is very, very much defined in terms of, of right-wing and, and pro-fascist groups and personalities. So if in Italy Christopher Columbus is not a recognized national symbol and the glorification of individuals connected with the fascist regime is directly connected to ideological concerns, why has the fate of statues honoring Columbus and Mussolini Balbo and his regime become such a source of controversy in the United States? Or maybe said a little differently, why do many real or self-proclaimed Italian-American leaders identify the community's sense of identity with a 15th century navigator from Genova and a fascist thug who served, in the words of his biographer, as a pillar of a corrupt and cynical regime, the friend and collaborator of a demagogue who led his nation, and I would add the world, to catastrophe. And this is where this, this slide uh, is, is helpful. I was really looking for something that would exemplify this, this connection between Columbus and fascist symbolism in the United States. I couldn't think of one. So the only one I could think about is actually in Montreal. This is uh, Nostra Signora de la Difesa, which is you know, the, the church that represents the, probably the, uh, the, the first, and well, it's, when it was created, the largest Italian community in Canada. Um, you can't really see it here, but there's a better slide to come. Uh, this is right over the, um, well, it's right in the center of the church. The center, you have the Pope. To the left, uh, there's Columbus, surrounded by other figures like uh, Jacques Cartier, other important uh, travelers and navigators and explorers uh, connected with um, Canadian history. And to the right, of course, is, is Mussolini. Uh, I don't recognize the, the person on the right, on the, the fascist leader to, to the right there, but the one in the middle is Balbo, then Marconi, and, and, and others. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable using Canada in this sense, using this Canadian image, because in fact, the, what I'm about to say really, in, in a different discussion, really could applies to Canada as well. But th this is kind of a way of exemplifying this connection between, between Columbus and, and Mussolini, and uh, in this case, Balbo, um, in the United States. As we look to the questions that I've just posed, I suggest that a comparative approach to Italian migration in the years between unification and World War II can be very, very helpful. Specifically because it can assist in identifying the specific reasons why Italians, which shared common background and experiences before migration, developed different identities and therefore different memorializations, depending on the countries in which they settled. From the end of the Risorgimento to the onset of World War II, over 19 million Italians left the peninsula and the island of Sicily. They settled mostly in Europe, mainly France, Belgium, Switzerland, and Germany, in South and North America, as well in parts of North Africa and the Middle East. The arrival of humble Italian immigrant workers exposed and challenged the interaction of xenophobia and class interest in labor movements around the world. In France, Switzerland, Argentina, and Brazil, Italian immigrant political and labor leaders worked effectively for the incorporation of Italians into mainstream labor unions, helping blend workers of different national backgrounds in a common struggle against workplace exploitation. In the United States, by contrast, 
the process of incorporation was complicated by the hostility of the organization or the American Federation of Labor to immigrant unskilled workers. The situation left the majority of immigrant workers outside of mainstream working class organizations and forced them to confront exploitation in the workplace and xenophobia on their own. Cross-cultural comparison of labor reveals that in France, Argentina, and Brazil, and I'm going to focus mostly on Argentina, but in the case of France and Argentina in this case, those are countries that have a much higher percentage of their workforce was, uh, came from Italy. Uh, countries where migrants played important roles in building multi-ethnic labor movements, Italian national identities faded, and in their place, migrants developed from forms of unitary French, unitary Argentine, unitary Brazilian identities, which blended them with immigrants from other national backgrounds. When Even today, when we think of people from Argentina, we don't refer to them as Italo-Argentinian. Uh, uh, when we refer to Italians living in France, we don't, call, we don't refer to them as Italo-French. We re refer to them as Italia, uh, French of Italian origin. In contrast, in the United States, theories of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant racial supremacy, along with segregation from and within unions and labor organizations, encourage legal discrimination on the basis of national origin. In this context, Italians received very mixed messages about their place in the nation. Unlike their former compatriots in France or in Argentina, Italians in the United States did not develop unitary identities. Instead, they em embraced hyphenated or ethnic identities that combined a sentimental and not necessarily historically accurate attachment to the Italian nation with assertions of loyalty to the United States. So, how do the different ways in which Italians were incorporated, let's say in Argentina and the United States, and I use these two countries, first of all, of course, because we're on this side of the Atlantic, and secondly, of course, because of the size of, of, of the Italian community in both. So how does the different ways in which Italians were incorporated in, in, in Argentina and the United States, along with the dissimilar identities they developed, express themselves through monuments and memory? Well, one of the main squares in Buenos Aires is called appropriately, given the size of the population of Italian origin in that country, Plaza Italia. Here it is. This is a perfect image. Uh, at the center of the square stands an equestrian statue of the Italian patriot Giuseppe Garibaldi, the hero of the two worlds, as a symbol of the struggle for independence and freedom, both of Italy and of Latin America. Garibaldi spent a significant amount of time around the River Plate. His first wife, Anita, actually was from Uruguay, and he participated in the struggles uh, for national independence in, on both sides of the river. Now, in Buenos Aires, there's a Colón theater. There is actually a statue to Christopher Columbus uh, right behind the government house by the river, but they're not really, uh, actually the statue to, um, to Columbus was, was taken down a couple of years ago, I don't know if it's been put up, and, and replaced with a statue donated by Bolivia, uh, honoring a, a uh, um, native uh, um, resistance leader. However, unlike Garibaldi, Columbus in Argentina is not perceived as symbolic of Italy nor does he embody any aspect of the experience of Italian migrants to Argentina. Garibaldi does, and he does both because he is a symbol, a recognized symbol of Italian identity, and also because he is relevant to the experience of Italians in Argentina. A comparison between identity formation in Argentina and the United States suggests that the significance attributed by sectors of the Italian-American community to the monuments of Columbus and Balbo that I will discuss, talk about in a minute, has little to do with historically, historical connections to Italy. Instead, the elevation of these men to symbols of ethnic identity is the product of the historical circumstances specific to the United States. So let's talk about Columbus. It is important to note that the statues and monuments in his honor cannot be equated to those that lionized Robert E. Lee and other Confederate traitors who rose in arms against the United States to defend and expand slavery. These memorials were erected in support of Jim Crow and in opposition to the Civil Rights Movement. The story behind the exaltation of Columbus is very different. In fact, Italian immigrants were not the first to use them as a symbol. Columbus was first enshrined as an icon of U.S. exceptionalism and imperial expansionism by, again, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants starting in the late 1700s and through most of the 19th century. Of course, 
you think of Columbia University, you think of Columbus, Ohio, you think of the song Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, which was actually composed in the 1840s and, and remained for many, many years the unofficial um, anthem of the United States. In the early 1800s, with Columbus a recognized national icon, Irish Americans sought to establish their own acceptability within US society by underscoring his Catholicism. So the wasps, wasp had used them in, white society had used them to distinguish and differentiate themselves from, from, from Europe. Uh, the Irish step in and say, well, he's a good symbol to use. He was a Catholic, and, and that is, a, if we emphasize his Catholicism, that'll make us look good. So when in 1882 they founded what has become the world's largest Catholic fraternal organization, they named it appropriately the Knights of Columbus. Italians followed in the footsteps of the Irish, starting in the 1890s, just like the Irish before them, to counter the widely held stereotype of Italian Americans as violent, ignorant, religiously suspect people. They embraced Columbus not as a conqueror, not as a vehicle of empire and genocide, but as an acknowledged American symbol. In contrast to the Irish, rather than focusing exclusively on his Catholicism, in the end of the 19th through the early 20th, uh, through the 20s and 30s, uh, World War II and even the post-war period, spurred on by prominent community leaders, the Prominenti, for many working class Italian Americans, Columbus and anything associated with him, statues, plaques, Columbus Day, uh, Columbus Day parades, etc became a symbol of acceptability within a society that openly discriminated against them. Through Columbus, the Prominenti sought to ingratiate themselves with the Anglo-Saxon ruling class by helping establish and then reinforcing a hyphenated identity, which placed on one side of the hyphen the embrace of a shifting and unclear definition of Italian civilization, whatever that is, and on the other, an equally vague characterization of what it means to be a true quote-unquote American. In 1934, similar concerns for legitimacy and acceptance lay behind the erection of the fascist monument in Chicago to commemorate the first anniversary of General Italo Balbo's transatlantic flight from Urbetello to the Windy City. I'll do the same thing you did. How many of you, aside from two obvious people, but how many of you have heard about this monument before, the Balbo monument? Okay. Well, all right. Um, four. Four. <laughs> Two don't count. <laughs> One of the most prominent and ruthless leaders of the fascist black shirts, Balbo had a decisive role in the rise and consolidation of Mussolini and his regime in Italy. With the fascist in power, he was put in charge of building Italy's air force, and in 1933, he was appointed air marshal. Uh, this is a um, picture uh, actually comes from the Italian archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, of the inauguration of the Balbo, of the monument uh, during the World's Fair, the early 1930s World's Fair in Chicago. In the back is the Italian pavilion, which unfortunately has, was, you know, was made with cardboard and paper. It wasn't supposed to last very long. But it was a beautiful, beautiful structure. And this is the, um, the monument is in front. Unveiled to great fanfare during the Center of Progress Fair, this is what the fair was called, the monument is composed of a base of travertine surmounted by a 13-foot Roman column of green marble removed from an archaeological site in the port city of Ostia. So the statue is, no, the statue, the column is, is 2,000 years old. Um, the rest is a little more recent. On the base, framed by two fasci, which you can see in the, in the picture here, was, and it was originally in gilded lettering now that that part of it has, has been lost, inscribed a message in Italian stating that fascist Italy, and these, I'm, this is a direct quote, under the auspices of Benito Mussolini, was presenting the monument to Chicago in remembrance of Balbo's transatlantic flight in the 11th year of the fascist era. Balbo's transatlantic voyage, along with Mussolini's gift to Chicago, were part of a broader strategy pursued by the regime since the late 1920s. Fascist authorities viewed the United States as a vital economic partner and as an important source of credit. And consequently, good relations with the United States political and financial circles were considered essential to Italian national interests. In this context, fascist authorities launched a concerted and well-financed campaign to establish control over the Italian-American community and to ensure a sympathetic public opinion. 
once securely established domestically, Italian authorities and their supporters within the Italian community produced a depoliticized characterization of fascism, which, by adopting the language and symbols of patriotism, established a cultural definition of Italianità, which merged love of homeland with support for Mussolini, who at the same time, playing on a history of discrimination against Italians, also portrayed as an embodiment of a strong and respected Italy. To build support among Italian Americans, the fascist regime focused on promoting unity around recognizable symbols of Italianità, while at the same time highlighting the internationally recognized accomplishment of fascism. One way of achieving these goals, of course, were events such as Balbo's transatlantic flight. Since World War II, the monument has come to be known as the Balbo Monument, significantly uh, downplaying its fascist origin. In 1934, however, there was no such ambiguity. <laughs> Referring to the monument, Italian Americans and English language newspapers referred to it as La Colonna di Mussolini, La Colonna del Duce, and even as, and I kid you not, Mussolini's shaft. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually says it right there. I, that'll be the title of the article, I think. <laughs> not all Italian Americans, now and in the past, agreed with the exaltation of either Columbus or Mussolini and Balbo. As Laura Caputo and Joe Shorter, who's here tonight, discussed in their recent article, over time, organizations such as uh, the Italian Americans for a Multicultural, uh, for a Multicultural United States, the San Francisco-based Italian American Political Solidarity Group, or the no, no Columbus Day Group, have come out openly against Columbus as a symbol of Italian American identity. The same was the case with Mussolini, and I, I refer to it as the Mussolini Balbo Monument. Just you know, I, I, I don't want to create any con confusion. It's 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 the column we were talking about before. As the column was being unveiled, Italian-American anti-fascists mounted a vigorous campaign of protest. In a leaflet titled, Who is Balbo? The Italian Socialist Federation and the Italian League for, Hum for the Rights of Man denounced him as a terrorist and as a murderer. Since then, a broad collection of groups and personalities, not all of them Italian-American, ranging from the Chicago, from, uh, yeah, Chicago business leaders, veterans of foreign wars, Gold Star Mothers, the Illinois PTA, local political officials from both parties, and even the uh, Italian ambassador at the time, Tarchiani, spoke and organized in support of removing the fascist monument and of renaming Balbo Avenue to honor, uh, to honor someone else. Supporters of retaining the monument and memorials to Columbus and Mussolini Balbo have also made their views known representatives of local and national Italian-American organizations, such as the Order of the Sons of Italy, NIAF, the National Italian-American Foundation, UNICO, National, among others, through letters to the editor, radio programs, public demonstrations, and even on the internet, have expressed their opposition for any removal of monuments and the renaming of streets. The terminology and justification for erecting and preserving these tributes has hardly changed over time. In 34, Generoso Pope, in a signed editorial published in Il Progresso Italo-Americano, linked pride in Balbo's aviation feat, along with support from Mussolini and his regime, with Italian-American identity. So the two became one and the same. The, and I quote, unanimous, spontaneous, magnificent celebration by Americans of the most recent triumph of Italian av aviation, Pope wrote, fittingly compensates for the many injustices suffered in the past by our immigrants. 83 years later, Pope's rationale continues to resonate in current debates. In the midst of the most recent attempt to remove the Balbo column in Chicago, a historian of Italian Americans uh, writing on Facebook argued in favor of retaining the monument by stating that Balbo's flight represented the single proudest moment in the history of Italians in Chicago. Clearly then, many Italian Americans identify with representations of Columbus and Mussolini and Balbo for reasons that are specific to their experience as individuals and as members of a community in the United States. To paraphrase Gaetano Salvemini, marginalized by Anglo nativism who looked down upon them as inferior dagos and wops, many Italian Americans embrace an idealized image of Italy 
that provided a sense of ethnic pride within US society. While there are many clear similarities in the reasons why many continue to support these monuments, we also need to distinguish between support for Columbus and the Baldo Mussolini monument. Focusing on, on Columbus, however troubling, Italian Americans celebrate him, and as I mentioned earlier, not as an expansionist or brutal conqueror, but rather as a way to claim legitimacy within a society with a long history of racially and socially motivated victimization of Italian Americans. To ignore the fact is to discount the very real struggles of a once marginalized group of immigrants. In my opinion, monuments and memorials to Columbus, however controversial, should not be removed or destroyed. Instead, they need to be transformed. We need to engage with them in ways that are neither celebratory nor of denial, but rather contextualized to invite people, whatever their ethnic backgrounds, to reflect on the complex history behind these monuments. So those are monuments to engage with. The same is not true for the Mussolini Baldo Monument in Chicago. There is no doubt that many Italian Americans endorsed Il Duce and adopted an ethnic identity associated with support of Mussolini and his regime for the same reason they embraced Columbus, as a psychological reaction to a feeling of inferiority within a host society. Some of those who argued in favor of keeping the symbol honoring Mussolini and Baldo maintain that we cannot judge their actions by today's standards. In the case of this monument, the same historian I mentioned earlier wrote, do we read history backwards and dismiss actions uh, and people who don't meet modern standards and moral principles, or do we try to understand change over time and how it's imp it impacts human activity? While there might be some value to this argument when we talk about Columbus, the same is not true about uh, either Mussolini or Baldo, whose actions cannot be simply explained away by claiming that it is unfair to judge them by today's standards. In the 1920s and 1930s, Italians had options, something which Italians in Italy really did not have. They could support fascism or they could oppose it. A small but vocal number of Italian American women and men found in their opposition to the regime and to the spread of fascism to other countries, the ideological foundation to challenge the official image of Italians as militaristic, aggressive, and imperialist. Instead, they created an alternative definition of Italianita centered on a filial relationship with a mother Italy as a personification of an egalitarian tradition and the battle for universal freedoms. Consequently, for this group of Italian Americans, anti-fascism provided an alternative characterization of what it meant to be both an Italian patriot and a true American, based on the connection between the battle for higher wages, improved working conditions, and union recognition. In the United States, as well as within the national and international struggle against fascism. So unlike the monuments and memorials to Columbus, it is impossible to engage and diffuse the significance of the Mussolini Baldo monument. It therefore, in my opinion, needs to be moved out of a public space into a museum. It's a beautiful column, so let's move it somewhere else and, and, and deal with it. And Baldo Drive should be renamed. In the end, and this is where I conclude, whatever happens to these monuments, I feel there needs to be a broader conversation among Italian Americans over the significance of memory and community. We need to stop focusing again and again on divisive figures that do not represent the experience of the millions who left Italy and came to this country to become the human steam shovels of its industrial capitalist development. Why not find ways to honor those who battle exploitation and discrimination? Why not draw inspiration from the scores of Italian American women, men, and yes, children who struggle for social justice and civil rights for all and join together with other Americans of all creeds, racial and ethnic backgrounds to assert our commitment to, a building, to building a truly pluralistic and just society and the monuments that represent that. These are the monuments that should be built. Thank you. observations and points of reflections uh, that came to my mind. First of all, many Americans don't know perhaps uh, that the, the symbol of fascists, uh, which is inside of the monument of uh, 
Lincoln Memorial in uh, Washington. It's the same symbol that fascists use. And so uh, when the students ask me why fa uh, these fascists are um, so an object of contestation in Italy, whereas here is a sign of uh, uh, unity and fraternity of the, uh, of the American people. So what are um, the meaning of uh, the same uh, kind of mm -hmm. uh, um, symbols are different in relation to the uh, utilizations that has been made, of course. Uh, before fascism, the, the same uh, fascists had no the same meaning. Um, so there is a kind of m mutation of meanings in the same object that uh, uh, are present in, uh, in monuments. It's not, not simply the monument, but the, the parts of the monument can change in relation to so this came to my mind in your reflections on the Roosevelt um, um, uh, monuments. Um, the, the second um, observation that uh, came to my mind is uh, this idea of censorship and remotion. I mean, censorship, uh, when it is a voluntary kind of intervention, is of course an object of reflections. But censorship uh, can be, let me be uh, provocative here, <laughs> I don't know. Um, is a way of remaking history, which is made in the past. I mean, after all, our books, uh, textbooks of uh, history are forms of sen sensorial changes of uh, uh, parts or chapters, sub-chapters of histories of countries. Um, so I would also historicize censorship. Uh, many of our textbooks are out of, are made by different kind of censorships of history. So Renan used to say in 1871 that uh, um, the nation is a kind of uh, plebiscite that we make every day, meaning that every day we make a change of what we were yesterday and we rewrite history. So the present is a form of censorship of the past necessarily. Um, it's not one way, there are many other ways. Um, finally, third point, uh, the um, uh, monument never, a non-existing monument is also a sign of a time or a sign or, or a, a, an object, is a monument in the absence. Uh, for instance, the case that you were referring to of um, mm, the tri triangle. The, yes, uh, it's a, a, a non-monument, a, a non is, a, is an absence that is in itself a monument to a, sign, a, a sign of non-attention uh, or uh, of forgetfulness or lack of memory, uh, abandonment of, of memory by the majority of a population. And this is also a, a monument in the negative somehow. Uh, so when uh, this monument will be inaugurated uh, or memorial, uh, perhaps uh, this uh, lack of uh, knowledge or uh, remember uh, uh, memory for many, many years should be remembered. Uh, how many years passed or what, more than 100 years? And, uh, and yet, uh, you know, to give a date to the moment in which we remember is also an interesting uh, a part of the history of, uh, of memory somehow. Thank you. Um,
do not need to do it whatsoever to get up. And here, when I see all these wonderful flags to wave, basically, I'm not celebrating the discovery of America, but celebrating that Columbus was a pioneer. And that time, he was still kind of the past. Columbus did not, at any point, to change the Italy. And again, the small festivity of Spanish, for the Spanish, for the Spanish, uh, for the Spanish by Spain, did book Columbus. That's basically what it is. It has nothing to do with Italy, it has nothing to do whatsoever with the culture of Italy or with the religion, in a way, which is not the same as Catholic, but basically, just small links whatsoever between Italy and Colombia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to respond to actually both parts of your comments. Um, the first part about that monuments are important, teachable object. Um, relates directly to an initiative that I started after the last election, not in response to all this, where I think many of us were concerned with the siloing that occurred and or we became aware of. And I began to think that monuments could be used to start conversations among people of differing opinions. And I spoke to my daughter, who's a preschool teacher, and she said she could do it with her four-year-old and I know I can do it in the university, and I know it's been done in grades in between. So this is something that we are really attempting <coughs> to realize as something that could be embedded in school curricula from pre-K all the way up. So here's hoping. Um, for the other part of your question, what occurred to me as you were making the comments about Columbus, all of which of course are true, is this is a memorial or a monument that has gained meaning through use. Yeah. I mean, and that's a much more radical gaining meaning through use than the kind of shift of emphasis with the Lincoln Memorial. But once something is used in a certain way that gets embedded in the culture, it's a little bit difficult. Yeah. It has to be recontextualized, but there will be resistance. Could we get somebody else maybe if the other yeah. people have? Questions? Yes. That's something the Memorial Commission is wrestling with, e even as we speak. And I think that contradiction is really, really important to keep in mind because there are several truths, and sometimes there are many truths, and sometimes there are a number of alternative facts that get become embedded in our experience of these memorials. How do we get all those truths out there in a way that people become aware of this really complicated situation? Um, we're right now, this is me personally, teachable monuments, I'm not talking about the commission. I, the commission report has not yet been written, so I can't say anything about that. Um, but one of the things we're thinking about is, is there a way digitally um, to perhaps implement something like the app that they use at the Brooklyn Museum called Ask a Curator, so that if you got to, let's say, the Columbus Memorial, and there was some indication that such an app existed, you might be able to ask questions that would inform you of the history of Columbus, inform you of the history yeah. of the immigration patterns, 
talk about the absent Native American history, mention the Lenape, all of those things. I mean, that's one of the things we're thinking about. But if yeah. anybody has any other ideas, please. And I agree, I agree with you. I mean, we can remove the statue, but nobody's going to turn around and give Manhattan Island back to Native Americans. And so I think that, in many ways, <sighs> while the struggle, for instance, against Confederate monuments, which were created under different circumstances, I mean, there is something positive that you can build out of that battle. I mean, there's something that really can bring about some significant change. Uh, in the case of, of, of removing a statue of Columbus, nothing really is going to change for those who were most negatively affected. Well, first of all, you know, who were most negatively affected uh, by, by his arrival. So it's, I, I agree with you, there is, there, and, and with you, there is, there is, there is a contradiction. Uh, I wanted to, I, th I think we should, it would be interesting to hear more about this whole issue of censorship. Because in fact, I don't really see the removal of a monument as I as I speak as a form as a form of censorship. Uh, this whole notion, of course, uh, we are removing our history. History is not done by monuments. Monuments serve to memorialize and remember uh, and exalt parts of history that we want to remember that at a certain time we think we should remember. Uh, books, uh, articles, films, uh, video, podcast, or whatever. That is how we learn and teach and discuss and discuss history. As, as you pointed out, there's that wonderful monument uh, that I'd never even heard about that is there and, and, and the fact that nobody remembers what it represents, it's, it's, it's not the fault of a monument, uh, of course. So I don't really see it as a form of, of, um, of censorship. I do, however, agree that we have to place the monuments in their proper context and understand what they do represent. Clearly, in the case of Columbus, Columbus in the United States for Italian Americans, and that, that is the experience that I'm writing about, uh, that, I, that I'm talking about, has a certain representation. It represents something which it does not represent elsewhere. Now, if we do not acknowledge why he is there, if we do not acknowledge the reasons behind the Italian American experience that led to this association with Columbus, then in fact what we're doing, we're taking one experience of, of, of hardship, one experience of marginalization, and we're shunning it and saying, okay, this one doesn't really count that much. We're going to emphasize another one. So the reason I think would be, the solution would be, and in this case, in the case of Columbus, I agree, to interact with the monument. Let's build other monuments across the street. Let's have other monuments in which you know people, it's not my original idea, but anyhow, it's Mary Ann's, but uh, who's sitting right over there? But why not build a set of other monuments that engage engage with 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 Columbus? They're not going to rename Columbia University. We're not going to start singing uh, Native American people, the gem of the ocean. That that's not going to work. That's not going to work. But we can have a discussion. What I s the 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 contrast instead that I have with with the Babel monument is very very different because there. The context was a context in which there were options. And to emphasize and to memorialize one of those two options, which we all well know what the consequences and the impact was not only on Italy but the rest of the world, and dismiss the fact that there was always an alternative and that people openly and clearly advocated for that alternative. I think that is, that is a, m makes it a different issue. And again, I'm not in favor of destroying it, I'm just in favor of removing it from a public place, the same way I'm not in favor of removing the frescoes at Nostra Signore La Difesa, but what they've done in Canada, which is really interesting, is that there are plaques in front that explain the controversy around those, those plaques so that people can interact with them. Sure. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. So, and, and that's where people ask, you know, like separation of arts. It's one thing to transfer skills, but it's something when people are talking, they just they stop it as a war game. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. Not all of them. Not all of them. Think St. Gaudens for No, me. thank goodness. Uh, but, but it would be, you know, something, you know, where I, I love, I think it's a lovely way of like uh, uh, making something different. Mm-hmm. Uh, temporary interventions. But it happens. Yeah. Well, this summer we visited you know, Memento Park in Budapest, and I, I really, I, I, you know, my, my stomach was churning, of course, because in the context of, of this of this kind of rewriting of history, uh, everything that has to do with the memorialization of of the struggle in World War II against against the Nazis, of course, is now perceived as a symbol of Soviet occupation. So it's moved aside. So all of a sudden. You know, Horty and 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 the Nazis become not so bad. I mean, it's it's a, it's these are really really complicated issues. But I think we have to find ways of engaging, where there are different ways of addressing certain monuments. Clearly, in post World War II Europe, the issue of the elimination of of Nazi monuments played an important role. So there isn't there isn't one solution. I think there has to be a, a necessary and important conversation at all levels. When, 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 when these things happen. And I think that's the point I try to, I try to make, that in fact, while Columbus and Balbo really are the product of similar concerns and similar, um, and similar experiences, they need to be treated differently. Well, that's a good one. So, <laughs> right. So let's jump. Let's jump into that one first. That is a really good question. Um, one of the things that's being considered by the commission is precisely that: how long a period of time, if there is sustained community, however we define that support, should there be an investigation taken? Um, but keeping in mind that the issues change, and right now, you know. Monuments and memorials are symbolic. On the one hand, and go this goes to the censorship issue, they're works of art that in a certain way should be protected by the First Amendment, but art is not as protected by the First Amendment as words are, particularly abstract art or allegorical art. But separate from that becomes the issue that's attached to them for better or for worse, and sometimes in truth, as we heard with the Baba Mussolini, and sometimes perhaps not in its entire context, like the Theodore Roosevelt. So I think that the performative aspects are important, but I think that removing monuments does not address the issue. It would be much better to be proactive once these controversies arise or these performances, which I think is a really nice way of describing it, arise, 
and saying to the protesters, how can we really address this issue? One, maybe, you know, series of conferences or get the legislatures involved. And two, how can we contextualize this memorial better to understand that in this context today, people are seeing only whatever it is they're saying. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I'm not sure I can answer. Uh, let me let me find a way of answering your question. I think that you know this is since this debate when it comes to Columbus is so central to the Italian com American community and so much you know there's so many people who've actually gone and spoken as presented themselves as spokespersons for the Italian American community. I think there really is a responsibility to address these issues in in as in broader society, but also within the community itself. And I think events such as today's and the one at the Calandra were really, really very, very, uh, very helpful in that sense. Um, I don't think I don't think those historians who promoted that initiative are speaking in a bubble. I think there really is a long, an established tradition of. I mean, I think about 18, uh, 1992. I mean, all the whole controversy around this, the commemoration of Columbus then. Um, in which the Italian Italian Americans of different groups were, were really involved. So I think I think it's very very helpful and very important that we engage in this conversation. Um, my particular take, of course, is the emphasis on what it represents for those who created it and f what it represents for those who supported it. Not so much the prominenti, but how really Columbus became a symbol of or a response to discrimination, marginalization. And, and oppression, for whatever reasons, that's the that's the symbol they, they took. So for me to remove him, the danger of removing him and not engaging with him, or engaging with a symbol, what it does, the danger is that it continues that process of marginalization. We're you know turning to a community and saying we really don't care about what 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 your experience. We would really much much rather favor you know, the, the experience of, 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 of Native Americans, which has, was, was certainly worse, but doesn't exclude the experience, doesn't eliminate the experience like that. So I think that's where I say we need to engage with the monument uh, and not to eliminate two, it. Two I, I don't know if I'm answering your question.
Yes. Yes. Does everybody know, does everybody know the reference? The, okay. Because they're they're along Broadway. We've had ticker tape parades, right? We're more familiar with having them for sports events. But for every parade, there's a plaque in the ground that indicates the date and the person who was honored. It is a, a historical record of fact. They are working on creating more information online, et cetera, about this. But the Patan is a perfect example of how the Times can get it wrong, um, and many people can get it wrong. Um, he was commemorated for deeds that he did in World War I. This parade happened before World War II ever began. So even though he became a dreadful, horrible person, and they would not have had a parade for him after his deeds in World War II, this is precisely as you say. It is a record of fact for everybody who had a ticker tape parade, period. It is history of the city. One of the big problems with it is it's called a canyon of heroes. And that, you know, just puts a whole other, I don't even know what to call it. But that came after, it, the, per, the markers of the parades came after the canyon of heroes. And so the fact that these two have become conflated somehow has made this issue more complicated than it is. Balbo also has a name. He was also given a ticket to parade. the last one. Yes? Yes. No, no. Uh, yeah. Did you uh, reserve? Oh, oh no. Yes. No, no. Yes. No. Okay. I saw your hand many oh. times before. So. <laughs> just a, uh, just for a, an observation. So when we did this, we did a similar, a different event with a similar theme at the London Institute. And I was struck because the respondent there also brought up uh, and censorship was raised. And, and I don't know that I would agree with that, that moving a, a, a monument is censorship. I, I would think of censorship as kind of getting rid of something before it's said, right? Before it's prior. The idea, I mean, legal censorship, censorship legally means you can't say it. Um, not once it's said, you have to apologize and retract it, but that you can't say it. Um, but in both cases, I was struck that the commentator made an analogy between literature or books and, and, and monuments and memorials. And it seems to me what, what I don't know that any of us have really addressed is the physicality of monuments and memorials and the, the importance of public space. So you can, you can write a new history of you know, anything, but it doesn't mean that the other books that exist are gone. Right? I mean, and I can choose whether to pull a book off the shelf and read it. But I can't choose when I walk through Columbus Circle whether to see that monument or not. And so I think that there's a profound difference between a material object in public space for which you have finite room, and theoretically we can write endless numbers of books. So I, I'm, I'm increasingly uncomfortable with the analogy between when we write a new book, it's, it's revising the past just like taking away a monument. It's not, um, it, and it never will be, because there's a limited number of spaces to put things. And as someone who's building, the Triangle Memorial is a, my project with a, with a wonderful collective of people. It is extremely difficult to build a memorial, really hard to get the money, the space, the, you know, the, the support for it. It is much easier to write a book, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in Manhattan Plaza living. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and, mm -hmm. and not to pick on you guys for living, no one talked about the gender of it. Everybody up here sure. who was, who was controversial was a guy. Um, and, and, right, the only thing up there that addressed women was the, the Triangle Memorial that does not yet exist. Um, so I think that, that one of the, the issues that I, that I think would help to solve this problem is, you know, you addressing the issue of limited space in a city like New York, and then who do you get to see that looks like you. And so I think we don't pay enough attention maybe to the Willow Memorial because there's your point about there are some memorials that, that we, just, we need to think about and we need to get more imaginative about who we build them to and how we build them. I'm happy to say that the Memorial Commission is addressing just that issue. It intends to be quite proactive 
in terms of reevaluating everything that's out there and what's missing, and I can say that with some May safety. May I add, uh, however, again, that just to propose a question of uh, Facebook's uh, ethics, which I'm invited friendly to, which I don't think is the case, but this is another story. So I tell you, the, I tell you a interesting story, uh, which would have been central to one third written a book. Um, there was a very important book, uh, which is the Elogio della Follia, the pride of uh, folly, can you say, of, uh, yeah, by Erasmus. Uh, the story is that uh, this book was never uh, forbidden uh, to Italians, because the church, as you know, of Rome, uh, put uh, these books in the index. So in, in theory, nobody could read the book, but in fact, they say it's not true, because the church allowed, in fact, to read the book. It's, it's not true that was the central to both radical. This could be wrong because the, the way in which this book uh, circulated for centuries, at least for two centuries and now, was full of holes. So it was the book and they cut down physically all the parts of the books uh, that were supposed to be uh, against uh, the doctrine of the church. So of course the material in the book was there, but it was another book because it was a book of emptiness, uh, of <laughs> many parts. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways of uh, intervening the censorship, even in something that has been produced. So the kind of uh, um, Erasmus that the Italians read could, for the case, was a different Erasmus, completely different from the uh, actual original. So thank but you. But it's interesting that you have to pick an example from that and not now, because now that would be unreadable. <laughs> So that's sort of exactly to this point. There's a difference between materiality and intention. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. And, and, and more yeah, monuments are. Yeah, yeah. The only way that it was. Uh, Net neutrality. No, no, no. That's an argument for not reading. No. <laughs> okay. I don't agree with that. Okay. So um, I think uh, we can uh, close this uh, very interesting yeah. seminar.